Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Stour head, and I know what you're thinking, but this is another of those classic English stately homes with dusty wallpaper and all those chairs with those pine cones on. Well, let me tell you now, you couldn't be more wrong. But there are pineapples. But this is one of the most exciting historic houses in the country. Once upon a time, this house was at the forefront of art and design, architecture and interiors. We're talking big, bold, new ideas which had never been done before. This place was a hub of creativity, of experimentation. And once more, it's had a pretty dramatic past, peppered with outrageous parties, terrible tragedy, and even a visit from King Alfred the Great. Hold on to your hats because there's a lot of history to pack in. These are the secrets of Stour Head. Uh, hi guys, the original link to the video, top of the description below that, link to the Discord, I'd love to have you. My name's Connor, if you are new, let's go, shall we? Good. 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 Great. Let's go. The story of Stourhead, in a nutshell, is this. Sorry. The Sturton family, that's spelt S-T-O-U-R-T-O-N, were on this land since Saxon times. They were a powerful family, and they built a grand manor house here, some of it funded by French prize money. And by the 1600s, visitors noticed the great open-roofed hall, which was extraordinarily large, with a high open-roofed kitchen. Where then are the remains of that magnificent manor house or the family who lived here for 500 years? Well, I'm afraid to say there's really not much to see. All I've got for you are these effigies. We've got Edward, who was the sixth Lord Sturton, lying recumbent here in a suit of armour, and his wife Agnes, and they're located near the altar in Stourhead Church. You see, the Sturtons were staunch Catholics, and they paid the price, for it made almost every part of their life difficult. By the 18th century, they'd fallen on hard times and faced financial ruin. And so the days of the Sturton family on this land were over. In 1717, the estate was bought by a family who had a fair bit of cash to splash. It was the dazzlingly wealthy banking family, the Hawes of Fleet Street. That's Hawes spelt H-O-A-R-E. Thank you very much. The Hall family, over several generations, really put their stamp on this place. They demolished the old manor, doing such a good job that we genuinely have no idea where it is today. In its place, they built a vast Palladian country house and packed it with art. And they completely re-landscaped the place too, creating lakes, adding in temples and grottos and follies here, there and everywhere. So everything you see today at Stourhead began with the most formative of experiences, the gap year, or at least the 18th century version of one. It was common in the 1700s for wealthy young men to head out on what they called a grand tour. They travel around Europe, particularly Italy and Greece, to admire the art of the Italian Renaissance and the remains of the ancient Greek and Roman worlds. Today, you'd come back with some holiday snaps, a few unsent postcards and a sunburn. But the members of the Hall family were so inspired by what they'd seen in Italy that everything they did in this enormous estate was shaped by this experience. First up, the house is built in the Palladian style. That's copying the architectural theories of the 16th century Italian Palladio. So it's very symmetrical, it's very grand with these great columns and a classical temple shape in the centre of the facade, but it's also quite simple. Palladio would have loved it. Mi amore. Mi amore. And inside, the house is packed with hints to the classical past. This, if you hadn't already worked it out, is the library, and it was built in 1792. This painted window, also known as a lunette, is a version of the famous fresco in the Vatican, the School of Athens by Raphael, showing all the big thinkers of the ancient world. And look at this magnificent desk. It's got all these tiny heads showing some classical figures and even some from the ancient Egyptian world. Even this carpet uses a design from a Roman tiled pavement. And if you look up, it's reflected in the barrel ceiling too. Look at this, 72 volumes of Voltaire. Talk about digging your own garden. 
But the gem of the Stourhead collection is no doubt this object, which looks like it might be a prop in an Indiana Jones film. This is the Pope's Cabinet, made in Rome in the 1590s, and it once belonged to Pope Sixtus V. Inside are 153 drawers for keeping all your bags. It looks like a bunch of, um, like trophies that you would get at, at like, uh, you know, in like a high school soccer tournament or, or, or something. I don't mean that to be like, oh, it's ugly, but it, it really does. And that's why it's, it's, uh, surprising how old it is. Valuables and secret items. And with that many drawers, ladies and gentlemen, you can guarantee your valuables are 100% secure. No one else will ever find them. And neither will you. It's decorated with every bit of glitter and bling you can think of. We've got gilt bronze, ebony, alabaster, crystal, garnet, jasper, lapis lazuli, amethyst, and mother of pearl. Phew. It really is dazzling. And in fact, I always think it's worth taking the necessary precautions in these situations. You can never be too careful. It's oh, better. And look at this. This is the picture gallery. And this is the star painting here, the Adoration of the Magi, which was painted in 1605 and actually hung in a church in Florence. But after the church was destroyed in 1784, it was bought by the Hall family in 1790. But what I'm most interested in about in this room are these landscapes. Now, these are in a style which was popularized by the artist Claude Lorraine, a 17th century Frenchman. Now, Claude as he was known, was incredibly popular. He really cracked it in terms of working out a formula and just churning them out. Although I'm not sure Ooh. art historians would appreciate me. Ooh. And just churning them out. Ooh, I love it. Although I'm not sure art historians would appreciate me saying that. But you'll always find the same features in these kind of paintings. It's a landscape, tick. Classical architectural features, tick. Leafy trees shaping the view, tick. People frolicking in the foreground in togas. They're I love landscape paintings more than any other, really. Or not just landscape, but realistic, you know, what, what are they? Re realistic paintings, because... I know it makes me sound boring, and it's because I probably am in a lot of ways. But I, I, I like it when I, I just want to see how gr great of a painter or drawer you are, okay? I don't want to have, oh, some hidden meeting or, like, splashes of something, like, you decide what it means. Like, um, oh, what does this represent? I, I Just give me a really nice painting. I... I it doesn't have to be... Look, I'm boring. There's hazy light, soft colouring, light reflected in the water. Tick, tick, tick. These paintings are key to understanding the building and landscape here at Stour Head, because in the 18th century, they literally looked at these paintings and decided that that is what they wanted to build. Let me show you. These are the famous gardens of Stour Head, all of which were mapped out in the 18th century. And it's basically just like walking through a Claude painting, just without the oil paint, thank goodness. They created this enormous lake and then dotted the landscape with little temples and all sorts of weird follies and then planted these trees to shape the view. Picture perfect, I'd say. This is the Pantheon. It's the largest structure in Stourhead Gardens and it was the final one to be completed. It's modelled on the Pantheon in Rome, which is a pretty like grand building to copy considering a Pantheon actually translates to a temple of all the gods. This building is made of limestone with a brick and timber supported dome. And you can see all these figures from the ancient and classical past. And it certainly impressed Horace Walpole, who in 1762 claimed that this building had few few rivals in magnificence, taste, and beauty. All 
what about this one, the Temple of Apollo, built in 1765 by the architect Henry Flitcroft to outdo William Chambers's earlier Temple of the Sun at Kew Palace. Luckily for us, those architects were pretty competitive. Apollo is known as the god of the sun, music and poetry. So this temple was created to show off the sunlight that would grace the garden within it. But some of you viewers might recognize this spot with very different weather. Yes, it was in this very spot with the rain tumbling down it's that complete. Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy had their explosive argument in the 2005 Pride ah. and Prejudice. And it went a little something like this. And what about Mr. Wickham? What excuse can you give for your behaviour? You take an eager interest in that judgment. He told me of his misfortunes. Oh, yes, his misfortunes have been very great. You ruin his chances and yet treat him with sarcasm. Your arrogance and conceit, your selfish disdain for the feelings of others made me realise you are the last man in the world I could marry. Forgive you. Madam, for taking up so much of your time. It's okay, don't worry about it. <laughs> this is the grotto, which was yet again inspired by Italy, when in the blazing heat of those Italian summers, they built these grottos to cool off. It's got this statue of Neptune, very apt as he's the god of the seas, the god of water. And then there's this statue of Ariadne inside reclining. But I love this. Instead of a sign that says, quiet, please, they've inscribed this poem by Alexander Pope, which reads, nymph of the grot, the sacred springs I keep, and to the murmur of these waters, sleep. Oh, spare my slumbers, gently tread the cave, and drink in silence, or in silence, leave. So you get the idea. Shush idea. The garden is like stepping back into a classically inspired painting. But back to the house, we've still got lots to discover. Guys, growing up, I used to, you see these like ferns right here? I remember seeing these types of plants in Jurassic Park movies. I loved them, like, you know, in the 90s. And when I'd see them like outside in the real world, I, I, I'd be like, oh my god. Did I just discover this new Jurassic plant? Got lots to discover. This is the Great Hall, and the paintings here are basically a big family tree. It starts in the late 17th century in this corner. These guys are the ones who started the bank. Then we have Henry the Magnificent here on his horse. He's the one who really built what we see today. And then on the other side, we have Henry the Magnificent's grandson, Richard Colt Hall, who was really into the classical history. And you can see him here with architectural plans and sketches. And then we've got a few Victorian dotted around. There's one over here, looks a bit pre-Raphaelite, but it really brings us to these two. We've got Sir Henry happily smoking away there, and then on the other side, his wife, Alda, looking a pretty resplendent. But if you look really carefully at the cigarette smoke in Henry's portrait, you'll notice that it makes the shape of Alda's silhouette. Henry and Alda huh? had one son known is Harry Hoare. Tragically, he was shot through the lungs whilst fighting in Palestine in 1917 and died in Alexandria. So this painting faces... Um, what's it called? Lawrence of Arabia? Like, so he, he was in similar time, right? Isn't that when... Facing his parents is a memorial to that terrible loss. Henry died the following year, and his wife, Alda, who had constantly been afraid of ever being alone, died too, just six hours later. So the line had come to an end. And so, in 1946, the 3,000 acres of land plus the house were gifted to the National Trust. 
Following on from the Great Hall is the saloon, which was used to entertain. In a letter in 1776, Henry the Magnificent wrote about his friends coming to stay, and what seems like a very jolly time that they had. I have held both my sides with laughter, he wrote, till I can hold no longer. They had such a hilarious time that one friend even forgot he ever had the gout. <laughs> You caught me playing Mozart. But the grand state rooms at Stourhead are only half the story. Time to head upstairs to explore the attics. This is one of the servants' rooms on the top floor of Stour Head. The youngest and most junior female servants really shared attic bedrooms. Their rooms were simply furnished with a hygienic metal bed, a washstand jug and slop bucket. Views from the windows were obscured by the stone balustrade and brick walls, ensuring that they couldn't waste one moment enjoying the garden views. There are all sorts of really interesting rooms here. We've got a research room, a textile store, but this room at the end is the furniture store, as you can see. So these are all the items which aren't on display downstairs. Now, the most important thing to note here are these orange squares. So in the case of a fire, you would grab these items first, as these are the most valuable. Good to know. This is really where the curators first, as these are the most valuable. You'd think you'd have them most retrievable then instead of what, why? Uh, valuable, good to know. This is really where the curators come, I expect, and spend all their time. Ah, who's this handsome fellow? Well, this looks like it might be a sketch in a classical style. It's a big focus on the musculature there. And I expect it's a kind of study by perhaps one of the artists that Henry the Magnificent patronized. Lovely. Time for a bit of fresh air. This is the bell that was used whenever they needed to summon people from the estate. Perhaps there was a time of crisis, perhaps people just needed to come to church, or perhaps someone was late for dinner. Now, I know we've talked a lot about being inspired by the classical world, but in the late 18th century, there was also growing interest in the medieval world. A romanticized view of knights in shining armor, of fair maidens and round tables. And whilst it didn't really get going until the Victorian age, the halls were, as ever, ahead of the game. And the best place to see this is out there in the garden. Let's go and have a look. Finally, I'm glad it's not all like we get it. You went to you went to Italy and Greece and you loved it, but finally some some variety. This is the Bristol Cross, bought by Henry the Magnificent in 1764. It originally stood in Bristol from about 1400, before it was dismantled in 1733. The cross was then bought in pieces by Henry the Magnificent and pulled here using six oxen and some wagons. We've got all the big names of history here, a bit like looking at one of those historical wooden rulers. We've got King John, Henry III, Edward III on the first story, and then it was updated in the 17th century with this second tier featuring Henry VI, James I, Charles I, and Queen Elizabeth I too. And once more, the horse had a pretty good reason Aww. to be into the medieval part. I want to ride a horse so bad, I've never done it. And once more, the horse had a pretty good reason to not be in just sit on a horse while it walks. I, I want to like, I want to go, you know, to the medieval past, because it's believed that on this land, King Alfred the Great rallied his troops in 878. Of course, there was no less fitting way to mark this remarkable event than by building a very, very tall tower. This is King Alfred's tower, designed by Henry Flitcroft for Henry the Magnificent in 1772. 
But this is really much more than a whimsical folly. This tower commemorates the accession of George III to the throne in 1760 and the end of the Seven Years' War. This was a time when the concept of patriotism was politically highly charged and Alfred the Great was seen as a defender of British liberty. It's a pretty big tower. And it's got some pretty spectacular views at the top. Wow. Today, the house is managed by the National Trust. So it always amazes me how flat England can be. Today, the house is managed by the National Trust, so you can come and have a look around for yourself. And I have to say, they do do some rather good flapjacks. But there you have it. Those are the secrets of Stour Head. Thanks so much for watching, everyone, and see you next time. Welcome to the... Uh, all right, guys. Sorry, I know it was a bit more quiet than usual. I am sort of waking up, and uh, I wanted to watch the video. I did it. It was really cool. Hope you guys are doing well. History hit. Great channel. I'll see you guys next time. Would appreciate any and all comments, guys. Bye.